The First World War shook the foundations of the Earth and reshaped not just the continent of Europe, but the world's understanding of what it meant to be at war. For far too long, war had been colored by the naive, almost optimistic belief among major powers of the 19th century that a nation's young men and boys could be tossed into conflicts with smaller adversaries and expected to come home with nothing more than a cool scar and a few war stories. But the Great War exposed two painful realities. The war is hell, and that overzealous, well-armed nations could visit absolute hell on one another, leaving all participants battered whether they won or lost. For almost an entire year, French and German troops ground themselves and each other into blood-soaked dirt in a battle of attrition that the world couldn't have even fathomed. Until, that is, it played out in a way that nobody could stop. This is the Battle of Verdun, the largest, longest, and most terrible battle of World War I. When the nations of Europe cascaded into battle at the outset of World War I, nobody on any side of the war believed that it would be a protracted affair. The military strategists of both the Allied powers and the Central powers expected a war that would be defined by quick and fairly restrained offensive attacks, just forceful enough to make the other side shut the hell up and capitulate. According to the thinking of the time, modern nations simply couldn't afford to sustain a long war. After all, their economies had far more important things to do, raising civilization up on a continental scale. And their weaponry, more advanced than ever, was also efficient. So efficient, in fact, that battles would be decided quickly and decisively. Lots of destruction all at once and then everybody could pick up the pieces. That assumption, however, was dead wrong. Tanks, combat airplanes, flamethrowers, machine guns, chemical weapons were all even more effective at killing than their designers had initially believed, but the fact that these weapons could kill a lot of individual men on an individual battlefield didn't make them efficient. Instead, they had an almost magnetic effect. In a war where neither side could stomach defeat, the only way to avoid defeat was to send more men and boys to the front lines, and every time a new soldier arrived, they were almost sure to be mowed down. Generals positioned far from the action had no issue sending more and more troops into those battles, and those troops had very little idea what they were actually walking into. By the time they arrived, it would already be too late for most of them to get out alive. By the time the French and German forces began massing around Verdun, this horrible process was already well underway. German forces had surged into France, taking significant territory and incurring devastating losses. But Germany's successes to that point were just as contingent on French failures as German successes. For example, France was convinced that it could hold its territory by holding hundreds of forts, which ended up being target practice for German artillerymen. French decision makers also had tended to laugh at the idea of heavy artillery and modern machine guns, which according to France's Inspector General of the Infantry, would not make the slightest difference to anything. Making matters worse, the French consistently underestimated just how strong German forces actually were. French strategists had the tendency to badly underestimate the value of Germany's conscripted troops in their reserves, informed by the fact that French conscripts of the time were widely regarded as being a bit sh**. The Germans, however, were not sh**. And when France's well-respected frontline infantry went up against Germany's frontline and reserve troops, they wouldn't just be badly outnumbered they'd be badly outnumbered with their best troops positioned right in Germany's crosshairs. Taken together, these failures meant that by the time German forces were encroaching on Verdun, France was getting shredded apart by the onslaught. French forces had at least the good sense to dig into defensive positions, trenches, that would keep their remaining men somewhat safer, and in response, the Germans had dug in their own trenches as well. Continued German offensives, with the goal of taking more territory, ended up just leveling the playing field a bit, as now it was the Germans who were unable to fully adapt to changing times. Despite small breakthroughs here and there, their assaults mostly resulted in the deaths of many Germans as opposed to relatively few French. The solution, as German leaders saw it, was to force a breakthrough, one massive, focused assault to shatter a part of the French defense, from which the Germans could then begin a much larger campaign of encirclement to overrun the French entirely. Their target was the city of Verdun, a fortress town that essentially served as the gateway to taking Paris outright. From the German perspective, Verdun was the best target they had. It was surrounded by the Germans on three sides. It could only be supplied on the French side by a single road, and much of the French artillery there had been shifted away to other parts of France, while the town's forts had been abandoned in favor of defensive trench lines behind the city. As the Germans saw it, Verdun should fall within a month if they could put enough pressure on it, and once Verdun fell, Paris had no hope of survival. 
The commander of German forces on the Western Front, General Erich von Falkein, was committed to enduring a battle of attrition in order to win his victory at Verdun. As he saw it, Verdun was more than a gateway to Paris. It was a linchpin of the French defense, and it was a potential major pressure point for French morale. And if Verdun was a city that the French felt they couldn't afford to lose, then it was perfect for the Germans to pile on the pressure there, forcing the French to bleed themselves dry in a ruinous attempt to pay for Verdun with human lives. Von Falkenhayn's strategy was as simple as it was brutal. First, his forces would make limited advances toward the city with the aid of a short but hellish storm of artillery fire. Then, French reserves would be brought forward to respond, only to be caught in the next wave of artillery shelling. The Germans would move forward, the French would respond, and the Germans would bombard them again and again for as long as it might take to finish the battle. This approach would keep France on the back foot, preventing any true counterattacks while forcing them to either react quickly or concede more and more territory. Now, we should note here that despite von Falkenhayn's statements after the battle, modern historians tend to agree that his goal was a swift victory, not a pure battle of attrition for its own sake. But such a battle of attrition was part of the plan regardless, even if it wasn't meant to go on nearly as long as it did. During this time, the French had been hard at work planning a counterattack, a breakout, if you will, in the same area. And even despite surveillance reports that the Germans were preparing their own offensive, France didn't discover the extent of the German military buildup until just days before the attack took place. From February the 11th to February the 21st, 1916, the French scrambled to fortify their own positions with thousands more troops and a full complement of heavy artillery, using more than 3,000 trucks traveling on a single dirt road to their position. That road would later become known as Le Voie Sacré, the Sacred Way, because of its role as an absolutely critical supply line for the entire battle. In the early morning on February the 21st, 1916, the German attack commenced, first in a bombardment that lasted hours, then by advanced scouts who determined where the vulnerable points of the French defense were located, and finally by German infantry who secured significant portions of France's first layer of defense using flamethrowers and machine guns. On the 21st, the French were forced to pull back three full miles from their initial defensive positions. Over the next few days, the Germans took full control of the first French defensive line despite counterattacks at the expense of thousands of French troops who had been told to defend essentially open land with only minimal cover. Within a couple more days, the Germans were through the second French defensive line, and as they did, the French commander at Verdun was relieved of duty. His replacement was General Philippe Petain, a man who, by the end of the Battle of Verdun, would become a war hero. But more importantly, Petain was also a rarity among French generals in that he was not only willing, but intent on spending just as much time on defensive strategy as offensive. When he arrived at Verdun, accompanied by an entire army's worth of reinforcements, he organized the establishment of a new defensive line that would be held at all costs. Rather than throwing all of his troops into a trench at the front lines, he organized his defense into a series of strong points, a mix of trenches, forts, and other established positions, all of which could cover each other. Petain's attempt to stonewall the German advance paid off. Although he conceded significant portions of the battlefield, he was able to greatly slow down the German advance and bought valuable time for French airmen to deal with the German airplanes overhead. Behind his infantry lines, Petain also brought a hell of a lot more artillery than had initially been present in Verdun, and he ensured that those artillery batteries were given the proper communications equipment to coordinate their activity. The Voie Sacré was kept open at all costs for more ammunition and supplies to arrive, and France was able to assemble a continual logistical effort dependent on automobiles on a scale that the world had never seen with motorized transport. And finally, he instituted a policy of cycling troops in and out of battle quickly, keeping his frontline troops awake and alert while giving respite to those who had endured constant shelling for too long. Almost as soon as Petain took command, Germany assaulted a nearby village with a force of 500,000 men. But despite such an overwhelming crush of enemy troops, the French were able to rally just in time, digging their heels in enough that the village was not lost. It's hard to overstate just how massive of a victory this was. The French defense, just days earlier, had been on the verge of being overrun completely. But the situation was no longer entirely hopeless. The Germans, however, they were forced to rethink their strategy. Initially, they'd been able to advance infantry under the cover of a heavy artillery barrage. But because French troops and artillery were now holding stronger defensive positions, moving German artillery forward meant putting it within range of the French's weapons. A full frontal assault was no longer entirely feasible, so attacks around the flanks, they'd have to do. Both sides might have attempted to take a bit of a breather, if not for the fact that the rest of the war was uh, still raging on. The Germans could see a British attack coming, targeted toward the upper part of the River Somme, and they intended to tie up as many French in Verdun as they possibly could. 
The French, by contrast, wanted to keep German forces from departing Verdun so that they couldn't go reinforce the Somme. In early March, the Germans carried out a more careful assault, capturing that aforementioned village that the French had initially managed to hold and contesting control of a hill that was quickly turned into a no-man's land between the two sides. The Germans used these gains to push inward. The French recalibrated their lines, and once the French had an opportunity to dig in again, they repelled subsequent German attacks around the River Meuse, which runs through Verdun. The battle fell into a stalemate for the month of April, and after the catastrophic losses in March, it was a critical reprieve for the leadership on both sides to think through their options. But nowhere on either side was there much thought of abandoning Verdun entirely. By this point, both sides had reason to think that they could win, and both sides had sustained too many losses to stomach the idea of turning tail. In May, despite renewed German assaults, the French began to work toward launching more counterattacks, and, and although pressure was ratcheting up on both sides of the battle to wrap things up in advance of a pivot to the Somme, neither side was in any position to fully bring down the other. The Germans were the ones in a somewhat better position to turn the tide, but their luck changed in early June when developments in a completely unrelated battle on the Eastern Front required Germany's attention to shift away from Verdun. Although troops on the ground continued to work for control of the city, valuable reinforcements were diverted eastward, and even though sustained German assaults through that period pushed General Patton and the French to the brink of complete collapse, the Germans were unable to finish the job in time. By the end of June, the Battle of the Somme began, and with both sides focused on that immensely costly battle, Germany's momentum at Verdun had ground to a halt. It was at about this time that Germany's position in World War I began to sour. Forced to weather the failures of Austria-Hungary and a combined assault from the British, the Soviets, and the French, the Germans were no longer able to sustain the same war of attrition in Verdun that they had previously been seeking out. More and more troops had been pulled away from Verdun, despite the fact that they were critical to any plans Germany had to take the city. On July the 11th, the German push forward ended in catastrophe, when 12 regiments proved unable to get the job done, and when the Germans tried to make major headway again a few weeks later, they lacked the ability to break through the French defensive lines. Once more, on September the 3rd, the Germans threw themselves up against the French defense, and once more, they failed. Germany, despite its best efforts, had been depleted, and the French didn't skip a beat. With Germany's soft underbelly finally exposed, the French began to push back. After holding their lines for another month, French forces, under the command of General Charles Manguin, assaulted the German lines, causing a slow, creeping, continual barrage of heavy artillery, followed by three French infantry divisions who mopped up anyone and anything left behind. Earlier in the battle, this sort of creeping assault could have been countered by Germany's own artillery or by a counterattack on another section of the battlefield, but now... There was very little that Germany could do to respond. General Mangin's counterattack claimed thousands of French lives, as well as German ones. Even after a trench had been thoroughly shelled, there would still be numerous troops left breathing, each of whom had no other option but to fight to the death when French infantry arrived. But the creeping counteroffensive worked. The French first retook several of Verdun's critical forts, then gained victory in hard-fought artillery and aerial battles, then retook the second defensive line the French had claimed at the start of the battle, and finally, the front line they'd been forced to abandon nearly a year earlier. With tens of thousands of Germans captured and the rest left with no other defenses to fall back upon, the French finally managed to retake Verdun for good. After a desperate battle for survival, France had somehow managed to win the battle entirely, saving not just the road to Paris, but the entire Western Front. Now, our description of the battle has thus far been based on the troop movements and territorial gains and losses on either side, but there's a second realm of the battle that deserves just as much consideration. Over several months of fighting, the lines of attack and defense in Verdun hadn't changed in any permanent way, but every push and pull, every attempt by either side to attack the other, had resulted in the loss of hundreds, if not thousands, of lives on each side. Often those losses had been incurred by truly horrific means. Bombardment under heavy fire, rolling waves of poison gases, or the use of flamethrowers and melee weapons at close range. Both French and German troops on the front lines had endured awful battlefield conditions in pockmarked landscapes of mud, blood, shrapnel, and, well, pretty much nothing else. The soldiers living in this hellscape a very different understanding of the battle than their generals did. Many accounts of the battlefield describe it as an almost dreamlike place, with a perpetually grey sky completely inundated with artillery smoke and with once lush forests memorialized by occasional charred stumps sticking up from a ground that looked more like the surface of the moon than any place on Earth. At night, the skies were alive with flame and explosions, a nightmarish facsimile of modern-day Fourth of July. And then, 
There were the bodies, often unrecoverable when they were killed, left out in the open for days at a time. Even when they were buried in the graves that were shallow and hastily dug, they'd be disinterred when the next artillery shell struck in the artillery. It never ceased. Death and dismemberment went hand in hand, with preserved, recognizable corpses being far more rare than unidentifiable rotting chunks of flesh, a foot here, a finger there, and some poor soul's kidney discarded in the corner. It should be no surprise that disease ran rampant in such an environment, and that the thick stench of decay and chemical weapons hung heavy over the entire battlefield, or that the troops forced to live their lives next to the dead were indelibly scarred. In the words of one American pilot who had volunteered to fight for France, quote, Nature had been ruthlessly murdered. Every sign of humanity had been swept away. Roads had vanished, and forests were fire-blackened stumps. Villages were grey smears where stone walls were tumbled together. Only the faintest outlines of the great forts of Douaumont and Vaux could be traced against the churned-up background. Only broken, half-obliterated links of the trenches were visible. Nothing in the war ever equaled the intense slaughter and gothic, nightmarish qualities of Verdun. And the quote ends. Other accounts followed with his, mostly from French and German infantrymen forced to survive in a place utterly bereft of the glory and heroism they'd thought they'd find in battle. One French infantryman wrote in June of 1916 as reinforcements finally reached his position, quote, oh, we're glad to get out of here because we've been completely brutalized by the bombardment. One has to have a strong heart to endure such a martyrdom. This is not a war, it's a massacre. Oh, when will it end? It's terrible to see what's happening. Said another, speaking of the dead and dying, farther on, there are many wounded to tend, others who are carried back on stretchers to the rear. Some are screaming, others are pleading. One sees some who don't have legs, others without any heads, who have been left for several weeks on the ground. And another quote, I stayed 10 days next to a man who was chopped in two. There was no way to move him. He had one leg on the parapet and the rest of his body in the trench. It stank and I had to chew tobacco the whole time in order to endure this torment. The psychological toll that this battle took on its soldiers on either side of the battle simply can't be overstated. As a French captain reported just after a quick taste of a done, at least compared to what many men experienced, quote, I have returned from the most terrible ordeal I have ever witnessed. Four days and four nights, 96 hours, the last two days in ice-cold mud, kept under relentless fire without any protection whatsoever, except for the narrow trench, which even seemed to be too wide. I arrived with 175 men. I returned with 34 of whom several had half-turned insane. A German soldier related his experience watching men from Verdun, the only survivors from a company of around 100. We watched as we passed them. They were about 20. They walked by us as living, plastered statues. Their faces stared at us like shrunken mummies, and their eyes were so immense that you could not see anything but their eyes. Even General Pertain himself had some understanding of the depth and magnitude of the horrors that he had put his men through, writing of them years after the battle. Their expression seemed frozen by a vision of terror. Their gait and their postures betrayed a total dejection. They sagged beneath the weight of horrifying memories. But perhaps one German soldier put it best of all. Our poor men have seen too many atrocities, have witnessed too many incredible matters. I cannot believe that we will be able to cope with this. Our poor little minds simply cannot comprehend all of this. It's possible to know just how many lives were taken during the Battle of Verdun. The nation of France estimates that 377,321 of its own citizens were killed or wounded during the battle, while Winston Churchill would later guess nearly 100,000 more French died than France had claimed. Other estimates go even higher. Germany is believed to have sustained at least 336,000 casualties, and again, individual estimates run tens of thousands higher. There were more costly battles in World War I than Verdun. The Battle of the Somme, for example, claimed over 1.2 million lives, whereas Verdun, at least, claimed under a million. But nowhere in the war was death and destruction concentrated quite so thoroughly. <laughs> 